in the Sky, the, the Decisive Centuries in British Art and Science. I did Fire and Ice, A History of Comets and Art, and Jay, of course, is an eclipse expert. So I'm going to turn it over to him to introduce himself. Okay. So uh, I uh, heard my friend, the art historian, Sam Edgerton at Williams College, uh, invite some visiting speaker, uh, one Professor Roberta Olson, uh, talking about Halley's Comet. So of course I went. And it turned out that uh, two thirds of her very interesting talk overlapped with two thirds of my comet talk that I've been giving a lot. And <laughs> the last third, I was talking about astronomy and she was talking about, uh, about art history. Uh, so, uh, so of course we talked to each other and, uh, uh, and we started working together. One of the first things that we worked on actually uh, was uh, with the Nuremberg Chronicle from 1493 which is uh, a, a book, the first edition of, uh, of which uh, they had in, uh, in the Harvard Library. And at that time, things weren't online. I, I kept going back and forth checking things. And we saw a picture, kind of a simple drawing uh, in many of the articles about Halley's Comet that said this was Halley's Comet, the first image from whatever, 500 years ago. Uh, but it turned out that the, uh, the artist for this book from 1493 uh, actually uh, drew uh, four different, slightly different common images and then turned them every which way, upside down and sideways, uh, spacing through about 15 or, or 16 uh, uh, comets over the chronology of thousands of years. Wow. That was, uh, that was in the book. Um, and uh, uh, well, so we wrote an article about that. And then a few years later, we actually heard that the original drawings and the, the book layout for the Nuremberg Chronicle had just been located in Nuremberg, where it had been hidden uh, at the onset of World War II. But the library found it wherever it had been hidden. And, uh, and I was able to get, or I guess we got both travel to collection grants from the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities to go to Nuremberg to, uh, to look at these, uh, at these drawings to see what we could uh, figure out uh, uh, about them. We had an article uh, about that. So th that was when we really started working intensively uh, together. Uh, Roberta had been asked to, to do uh, a show on comets for the National Air and Space Museum and had a, a book on comets in art. Uh, and, uh, but then- Called uh, Fire and Ice, A History of Comets in Art. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, very nice book. And uh, anyway, we started working together, as she said, with a whole bunch of, of articles. One of the other things that happened then was that the Euro European Space Agency uh, sent uh, a spaceship to go uh, near near the comet. Right. Uh, and, and, and just amazingly, they asked Roberta for her permission to name it Giotto, which- Oh, is wow. <laughs> that showed how important uh, Roberta- Can you believe it? And that's- and it's so dated because they sent a telegram. Wow, uh, wow. <laughs> uh, well, we ought to reproduce that telegram. You can still find it, Roberta. So, yeah, so, we should. Yeah, then when the first results came back, uh, the European Space Agency invited us to a meeting they had in Bamberg in Germany to release those first results. And we gave uh, what might've been an opening uh, talk uh, about it and uh, uh, and so we really got very, very involved, uh, uh, starting back with, uh, with Halley's Comet. That's really cool. Um, so kind of, I'm going to smash a couple questions together here, but because they're kind of similar, but, you know, as you were working on the, uh, I've skimmed through um, the, the book that you, that you sent me, but it's going to require some time and focus to actually, you know, it's very dense. There's so much information. There's so many beautiful pictures and let's like, it, there's a there's a ton you can actually see it behind you Jay on the on the shelf so what was the process of working on this you know how did you guys work together and how did you see kind of the science and art pieces really kind of coming together as you were working on on creating this book well uh, we had a, a comment this a uh, couple of weeks ago you know this last month comment Neowise yeah from a spacecraft and I went out a few nights and got some nice pictures and I just decided a couple of days ago that I, I was going to ask one of my students to put together a web page 
with the, my pictures of Neowise. I should have sent you one, but I didn't. Um, and uh, and then I decided, well, we might as well add some other people's pictures of, of Neowise as one over Stonehenge that I like. And then I, I said, well, maybe, uh, maybe I'll put a, a links to my articles on Comet. So I went into my CV and I just searched on the word Comet. And I came up with about 16 or so articles uh, co-authored with Roberta, uh, which I've which I've now sent. So so it it will be uh, it will be linked, I think, to solarcorona.com, uh, where I usually have a lot of eclipse stuff. But but we'll we'll put a link for the comet stuff. So we just had done a whole lot of artic of articles, uh, in, including uh, including uh, uh, largely comets that we started with, and these things accumulated, and then. And then we did a book uh, 20 years ago on comets in British art, and Roberta knew a lot. I certainly learned a lot from her about uh, about artists in uh, in Britain. And, and and I learned a lot about British astronomy. And um, <laughs> can you hear me? Because uh, unfortunately, my uh, iPhone and my connection here is breaking up. We can, but we, we can were hear you. so lucky because we got huge Getty grants to go and actually work in Scotland and England and research all this material in the Royal Society to look at the original manuscripts for the uh, transactions. And we found these incredible drawings by astronomers. And what's so interesting is before photography, of course, all astronomers had to draw. Right. And so you have this sort of leakage between uh, people observing the heavens as, as astronomers and also artists. And sometimes the artists would find out incredible things. So there was this wonderful um, sort of dovetailing between the two. And of course, we were always emailing and having conversations and meetings. And now we have like boxes and boxes of material and a huge archive of, you know, thousands of images of all these different celestial phenomena because when it started off on comets and Jay of course was fascinated by eclipses we also got into things like novae and meteors and the aurora borealis and so we got these huge files of both astronomical uh, photographs and astronomers drawings as well as wonderful uh, some of them naturalistic observations by artists and some of them absolutely fantastic imaginatory images like those of Blake, or you have Raphael with a fireball falling on the house of someone to signify the person was dying. I mean, it was wonderful to sort of weave together these things and also the contextualization, what was happening in the culture? Why were people doing this? What did it mean to them? And it was a very, very exciting process and it continues to be. So how many books worth of boxes do you have? <laughs> So we're, we're ready for a second edition already. So, uh, but we had all these articles. Uh, we there was a also a historic one on the first uh, comet photograph, and and uh, and and then other subjects in in astronomy besides comets and eclipses. And then a few years ago, uh, I was asked by a curator at the Science Museum in Kensington in London to do. They were starting a new series of popular books, uh, and they asked me to do one on the sun. Um, and I brought in a colleague, Leon Golub, from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and we did that. And they put that all out in, in color, whereas the book from 20 years ago was black and white with, with some color inserts. But now the technology is more advanced, and we started working with this uh, publisher we, uh, called Reaction, R-E-A-K-T-I-O-N, books in London. Uh, my wife Naomi and I had actually visited them once. Roberta hasn't actually visited. I uh, did actually. In person, did you visit Vivian? I visited, yes, Vivian. Well, anyway, um, so in any case, we were able to do a full color book and there are over 200 color drawings, uh, photographs, uh, and uh, and just a few are are of, of astronomical photographs as opposed to artworks of, of various centuries. Uh, and, uh, and so we have 10 chapters uh, on, on the different kinds of astronomical objects, solar eclipses, comets, meteors, uh, uh, deep sky, uh, galaxies, uh, et cetera. And it's just been a lot of fun and it, it really came out very nicely. And it's, it's really a, an adventure. And I must say that 
so much of it is discovery that people, you know, you may have seen these artworks before, you may not have, um, but people haven't looked at them for the astronomical phenomena that are there. Right. So while the book is the tip of the iceberg, you can sense the excitement of the artists and the astronomers and the photographers um, through it all and putting it together, we were also amazed at the kind of connections mm. at the various times about these phenomena. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to ask about that in a second, but um, I know, I don't know if you can find just one, but you know, obviously this process has lasted many, many years and has led to so many articles and now surely several books, but what was the you know, if there was a few, like some of the most surprising or interesting things that you found in this journey that just made you go, wow. Well, I, I still think you can't do any better than Jado. So. Right. <laughs> right. Did you show that? I can't see it. We did. Yes, we did show it. Okay, uh, I did not see it. Okay, great. Hold it up. And, and, and then what about a song, Jay? Tell them about, tell them about St. Benedict. Yes. Oh, so, well, let me just say one more thing about Giotto. So Giotto, the Giotto frescoes are in what's called the Arena Chapel um, in, in Italy. And so my wife and I in did- Padua. In Padua. Yeah, in Padua. My wife and I did go and, and, uh, and see that. Um, and, and you uh, and I did too. And we also gave a paper there. Yes. Yeah, so there were, then there was a meeting in, in Padua. So, uh, and we had a wonderful meeting in Venice uh, uh, then in, in which we, we gave uh, in which we gave a paper. And in fact, uh, up on the occasion of the meeting, we had a message from the Pope to, uh, to start the meeting and they put a plaque on the wall of the tower, um, the Campanile in Venice that said, here is where Galileo um, took the, pointed the telescope. It's in Italian, of course, so I'm just loosely translating. Right. Uh, uh, pointed the telescope and uh, enlarged the horizons of Humankind. <laughs> wow. We've had, uh, and, and then uh, we gave a joint paper at the Meteoritical Society in Rome uh, uh, and some of our findings, and that was 2001. So we were unfortunately in Rome on September 11, 2001. Yes. Oof. It was something. Yes. Um, and we had previously arranged. Uh, to be at the Pope's weekly audience the next day. Oh, so wow. That was a very moving thing in the big St. Peter's Square. Um, so we were stranded in Rome for a few days uh, when the planes uh, didn't fly. But in any case, that weekend, a brother Guy Consolmagno, who was the director of the Vatican Observatory, had arranged to take us to Castel Gandolfo, the Pope's summer residence, where they have uh, a meteorite collection uh, from the early 19th century. Uh, and he was then, the, he wasn't the director then, he was a curator of meteorites, I guess, a planetary astronomer. Um, and, uh, and we had a group of maybe a dozen of us who, who went out to suburban robes to, to uh, the Castel Gandolfo. Then the, uh, uh, the uh, library there overlooks the probes private garden, so the astronomers aren't supposed to go in the library when the Pope is still. <laughs> but, but other so than that, I'm, going to have, I'm going to have to bow out um, okay. because I have to deal with cyberspace. So no uh, Jay, Thank why you don't you talk about <laughs> St. Benedict? Yeah, well, but I'm glad you could participate this, this long, Roberta, and then we'll talk soon. Ad Astra. Thank you so much, Jillian. Bye, Jay. Bye. Bye. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so Roberta, uh, did uh, retire from Wheaton College, and now she's the curator of drawings at the New York Historical Society, uh, where she's written some prize-winning books. And one of the things they have is that Audubon uh, did paintings of, uh, I forget exactly how many, I think 160-something birds, and everybody has seen the reproductions of the engravings that were made from the drawings but the New York Historical Society owns the actual original oil paintings. Wow. She organizes shows of maybe 30 a year for uh, uh, year by year. So anyway, we continue on the astronomical things uh, that, we, uh, that we find. Um, there was uh, just a, a beautiful photograph that, uh, uh, that we saw of 
uh, this beautiful new comet, Comet Neowise, uh, over Stonehenge. Wow. And uh, uh, and so now we're we're asking for uh, updates of our of our books. We'd like to do a new edition of our uh, of our comic book from 20 years ago with uh, with a lot of of, uh, of updates. So anyway, uh, this uh, this current this latest book, uh, Cosmos: The Art and Science of the Universe. Right. Uh, is is our is our latest our latest uh, work with the uh, reaction press and uh, and we've been just collecting things about lunar eclipses and solar eclipses and comets and and uh, just the in the last few days we've had a meteor shower that many of your viewers uh, have uh, have seen uh, I hope the Perseids and uh, and there are some some uh, drawings and engravings from 200 years ago of uh, fireball uh, okay. over London, uh, over the Thames, and uh, but, but uh, there was an original oil painting um, that was in private hands in Devon. So Roberta and I made a trip to uh, to Devon uh, and uh, and learned what the difference is between Cornish cream and Devon cream. <laughs> <laughs> depends which is below, whether it's the whipped cream or the, the or the uh, uh, jam. It uh, just sounds like you know this whole process has led you to the most incredible places. You know, to searching yeah. down these paintings yeah. and meeting you know the Pope and all this kind of stuff. That's amazing. Uh, and then we discovered that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, the so-called uh, comet. Uh, oil painting wasn't really a comet, that it was a fireball. Okay. <laughs> and the way it was painted, and, and then we were able to track down the, the time, and there were some other engravings that showed it at the, uh, as viewed uh, by the, the Sandbeach painters and, and artists uh, from a terrace at Windsor, uh, at Windsor Castle. Uh, so we didn't actually meet the Pope. Uh, Roberta, from this meeting in Bamberg, was invited to go with uh, the chief scientist to go and meet the Pope and she decided to go back and teach her course at Wheaton College. I would have called Wheaton and, <laughs> and said, excuse me, I have an appointment with the Pope and I'll be a little late at the beginning of the semester. Yeah, uh, seriously. And she went back to teach her class. Yeah. So there's something that I, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, and it, it's too bad that Roberta had to leave as well, because I would be interested to hear what she has to say as well. Um, there was one of the articles, I, I, I'm blanking, maybe it was in the St. Benedict one that you sent me, um, which is kind of talking about, you know, science and art, and, you know, they kind of got separated across the years. And, and why do you think it's important to kind of to bring science and art back together, you know, um, and with these kind of collaborations that you guys are doing. Well, I'm coming from the scientific side. So sometimes we can use paintings to show something that actually happened. So, so we haven't discussed the St. Benedict yet, but we had, had learned that there was a picture of St. Benedict and an eclipse. And St. Benedict is, uh, is the, well, the original or originator of what's the, the Benedictine monasteries that are around the world. Right. And we learned that in three different Benedictine monasteries around uh, uh, Bavaria nearby, uh, there were the paintings of an eclipse. Uh, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union met in Prague, and I discovered that with only a few hours drive, we could go to uh, to one of in Weltenberg uh, in Bavaria, uh, and this was my wife and me. Roberta wasn't with us at the uh, at the time. Right. Uh, but we but uh, we wound up seeing uh, diff these different. Uh, uh, paintings by uh, Cosmo Damien Assam from a few hundred years ago, but the one in Weltenberg uh, had these strong rays coming out of the sun uh, in a way that nobody had ever painted it like that before. Remember, I already criticized the the Nuremberg Chronicle about comets, in which just right. very <laughs> simple drawings that they just turned every which way, and it wasn't necessarily giving the idea that this person had actually seen a comet. Right. Where this one in, uh, in Bavaria uh, showed that somebody had actually experienced the glory of, uh, 
of a total uh, of a total solar eclipse. Right. And, uh, and a photograph that I know you have, I, I, I saw you put it up at least in uh, in a test, was one I took on of the of the painting on the wall. Uh, I would have concentrated straightening out a little more had I realized. Had I realized. <laughs> Uh, 15 years later, and I've been using it uh, uh, so much uh, because this is a little known painting, but it really is wonderful. Uh, That's how beautiful. It viscerally shows the excitement that the artist had to actually see an eclipse. Uh, yeah. And uh, and so we've been, and then I do have colleagues who actually calculate where the eclipse are, the eclipses were, and we have maps every decade going back a thousand years, and we could pin down. Which uh, which eclipse could have been seen uh, by uh, by the artists on exactly on exactly which date? So that's that's been fun to track right. down the overlap of the actual astronomy uh, with the art history. Right, because they're kind of informing each other, and I think this is especially with solar eclipses that they kind of you know the science informs the art, the art informs the science. They kind of go back and you know together. Yeah. Um, uh, and then there are uh, globes that are celestial globes that have the constellations on them. And right. The, and uh, and so there's a Farnese Atlas, an Atlas with you know with a world on his shoulders, uh, in uh, um, in in Italy, uh, and with a constellation, but with the constellations uh, uh, on it, and uh, and and so I also have a collection of historic. Uh, uh, constellation books. Right. Constellations go back to a, a book by Johannes Bayer in 1603, uh, and and he did the drawings that were the most, or well, his engraver did the drawings that are the most familiar uh, uh, to us now. Uh, and then there was a wonderful enlargement of that with beautiful drawings by John Beavis uh, a few decades later. But then his publisher went bankrupt. Uh, just before the book, well, after a lot of the pages had been printed, but before it was bound and, and released. So this is a ghost atlas. And, uh, and I've been working with the Kevin Kilburn at the Manchester Society, Amateur Astronomer Society in England, uh, which, has, uh, which has a copy. And we have a web page. We've tracked down some three dozen or so of these atlases, which were never quite, uh, never quite uh, published. Um, and, uh, and anyway, we've had a side interest in, uh, in constellations and, and uh, tracing back the constellations through the books and the engravings uh, uh, hundreds of years. And so one of the chapters in, our, in uh, my book, Roberta, uh, the Cosmos, we have uh, historic constellations. That's really, that's really interesting. Actually, there's, um, because this is, this is being broadcast live, so there are questions from the chat and somebody was asking, if you find that people discount the scientific worth of ancient astronomy art? Um, discount? Well, uh, a lot of it is just, is just plain art and just plain, plain beautiful. So there's nothing really to be discounted. So right. I'm, I'm not sure what there is to be uh, discounted. Well, uh, let me take that back a little bit. Um, in, in 2017, uh, and, and just four days from when we're doing this on uh, August 21st, as uh, there was a total solar eclipse that went across uh, the United uh, States. And I, I was in Oregon uh, 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 for that. Um, well, well so, so in any case, uh, we had uh, an eclipse map that Halley had drawn in, in 1715 of the wow. eclipse across uh, across England, um, and uh, we had an exhibit at the Art Center College of Design uh, in Pasadena, California. The curator Steve Nolan was interested to put up an exhibit, and he found a lot of eclipse-related things that we hadn't known about, uh, and and one of those was some. Um, some uh, broadsides and religious things about the consequences of the eclipse and causing doom and causing, <laughs> um, and and so it's interesting to see on the wall these 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 old things, um, uh, and 
when you're putting links, I can give you a link to some of the things from that, uh, from that exhibit. And of course, th that's an example of something we discount on the, on the history that was kind of fun to have in a show on art and astronomy, but, uh, but we certainly uh, um, think the, the comet has brought us good luck and all those ideas that comets bring doom is just wrong. Right. I, th I think the question was more in the sense of like, you know, the art is not scientifically accurate. And so it's, you know, it can't be used with this kind of stuff. But um, yeah. Uh, so I well, think go back, go back to this, this, uh, this Truvolo uh, painting. So the, uh, the artist uh, Truvolo uh, in the 19th century, uh, he actually did some experimenting um, and brought some uh, some gypsy moths to the United States to see if, if they would, I don't know, help in pollination or something. And two of them got out, unfortunately, which uh -oh. was a disaster. So he yeah. gave up his biology and turned to astronomy and started working with the director of the Harvard Observatory. And he did a series of engravings of which there happens to be one uh, uh, with, a, uh, with a solar eclipse. Um, but the shape of the eclipse here I can see these straight lines coming out of the top and the bottom and then more continuous on the side. So that shows us that it's the minimum of the sunspot cycle, which is like eclipses that we're having now when we're at the minimum of the sunspot cycle with, with none or, uh, or one uh, sunspot on the sun instead of hundreds that we're going to have in, uh, we hope, in, in, in three or four years. So uh, we can trace back to, say, the 19th century where these uh, drawings are all that we have that show these details. So uh, the picture on the cover of this new book, Cosmos with Roberta, uh, is from an artist named Howard Russell Butler. And we've spent some time looking at the him. He had a degree in physics from Princeton, and but he turned out to be an oil painter. And uh, he had a technique of, uh, of taking notes uh, Maybe if he's doing your portrait, he would take some notes on the colors and some details, and you wouldn't have to sit for the whole time. Right, right. So the Naval Observatory heard that he was active in that way, and they invited him to Goldendale, Washington for the total solar eclipse of 1918. So, so just over 100 years ago now, uh, 99 years before the 2017 eclipse, to take notes during the eclipse. And, and he kind of joked, I guess, in one of his books that he usually got hours for a, a, somebody to sit for a portrait, but here he only had two minutes. <laughs> right, I saw um, that quote, yeah. <laughs> the painting that we have on the cover, and he actually did three big paintings. And they're big paintings. They're the taller, the, the one in the middle, when he went back in, in 1923, he was actually more than six feet tall, taller than, taller than I am. And, uh, and he tried to persuade the American Museum of Natural History in New York to do a, a, a planetary uh, room or a, an astronomy room. And he couldn't succeed in convincing them. But eventually in the, 19, in the 1930s, though he didn't get that exact room, they got some money from the state of New York and, and then some money. Then they tried all the rich people they had heard of like the Guggenheims and the Rockefellers and they didn't get money then. And they went to somebody named Howard Hayden, who was rich enough. And <laughs> I know only because of the Hayden Planetarium in New York. Um, uh, and he gave enough money with, uh, uh, to, uh, to build this Hayden Planetarium that was there in this Art Deco building from the 1930s uh, on to about 2000 with those three drawings, uh, paintings, oil paintings, by Howard Russell Butler uh, hanging over the door to the entrance. And then Butler did some half-sized versions and we were able to borrow some from the Buffalo Museum of Science. And I made a trip to Staten Island with my wife to see one that for some reason had an odd one there. And if you go to the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, you can see a half-sized version over the door to the entrance of, of one of their uh, lecture rooms. So that's been fun to see. The, the shape of the corona. You can see the shape of the corona changing from 1923 yeah. to 1925. Wow, um, that's that's just super cool. I mean, uh, I think there's there's so much in this book. Like it's just packed, and it's obviously just the tip of the iceberg. So clearly, there's more more to come, and and we'll be really excited about that. So 
just before we we um we finish off here um what are you working on now what's next for you in terms of the collaboration and personally and where can people go to find you if they want to follow your work uh, well uh thank you for asking so i have a, a website at solacorona.com okay and uh and that um and that links to our books and you can just click on on a, the thumbnail of this particular book or, or the other books um, and, and find us that way. Uh, I have a website at totalsolareclipse.org, where you know, all the words linked together, which shows the 72 eclipses that I've, uh, that I've been to with, uh, with, links to uh, uh, with links to various things. And, and there are links on, uh, on those sites to our other, uh, to our other work. Okay. Um, Next thing I'm going to do uh, within the relation is is I'm actually uh, teaching a, a course at Williams College, which is going to be uh, Zoom. Uh, though we're uh, usually the previous two times I've given the Red Bull course, we've arranged for the students to come in and see the actual first editions, going back to uh, hundreds of years, Copernicus, Newton, Galileo, etc. So my artist, my librarian. Rare Book Librarian colleague Wayne Hammond and I are working on a way of having the students able to see those uh, those uh, those books, and that's going to start in uh, in a couple of weeks. And a lot of students have uh, have uh, signed up for uh, for that. And uh, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to have Roberta talk at least at least remotely. I was hoping to bring her in person, uh, but our visits in person are obviously curtailed. Uh, uh, this fall, so uh, we'll so we'll see, and we'd love to do an updated uh, new edition of of the comet of the comet book because we have many more uh, comet illustrations than than fit in uh, one of the ten chapters in the in the latest book. Right. Yes, and definitely when that second edition um, comes out, you know, we'd love to have you on the show again to talk about that book and um, talk about some of your some of the things you found along that on along the way on that. Um, well, thank you for inviting me and us. Uh, and are there some more questions that are coming from the chat, or are we? There was just one more that I saw, um, but I'll let the let uh, guys if you are have other questions, so put them in the chat now. Um, there, I th I think it might have been answered earlier, but just in case someone was asking about the connection between the Nuremberg Chronicles and Halley's Comet. Uh, well, the Nuremberg Chronicle from 1493 uh, has hundreds of, of uh, engravings in them and woodcuts, um, which are line drawings of various kinds without a lot of detail. And, and then we realized that, for example, there's a drawing of Jerusalem with all these different houses uh, and towers, but it turns out that they use that also to show a different city at a, a later time. So the book is chronological, and there are uh, dates going back, uh, and this this comet picture from 684 was uh, said to be Halley's Comet, but that's when we realized it was just a, a, a generic, uh, a generic comet. Well, so uh, um, so it, it's uh, established say the periodicity of the comet, but not the actual looking. So one of the things we were looking at was when the astronomical drawings uh, became uh, accurate enough to show some validity. Uh, and, and you can follow that more in the shape of the, uh, uh, of the eclipses than, uh, than of the comets. But then there are a lot of uh, beautiful comet pictures, say from the 19th century, where clearly the artist has actually drawn a comet. And in particular, in the middle 19th century, a comet Donati was one of these daylight comets that just was dazzled for, uh, uh, for months, actually, with a big sweeping tail. And, and then there's one drawing over Paris with the star Arcturus very near it. And this latest comet Neowise from a few weeks ago actually looked a lot like it. It wasn't as big and broad, but, but there's some resemblances uh, to that. So you can, you can, um, so by the 19th century, you're getting uh, accurate enough drawings uh, that you can actually tell the shapes of things. 
Awesome. So we're um, we're here at about 45 minutes. So I'm going to wrap the wrap this up. But um, it's been delightful to talk to you and such an interesting project. I like I said, I can't wait, wait to read this book. Um, so thank you for for joining us um, and hope to talk to you again when the second edition of the comic book comes out. Well, thank you, Jillian. And thank you for inviting us. And thanks everybody who who tuned in. And, and again, uh, and I know you'll post some links, but at uh, solarcorona.com, uh, links to our books, including a place to click to, uh, to get our new book, uh, Comets, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, Cosmos, the Art and Science of, uh, of the Universe that we've had so much fun working on. Yep, and it looks like a beautiful book. Um, so I'll let you go, Jay, and I'm just gonna wrap this up, but uh, make sure you guys Tune in after a couple hours for the Daily Space, your uh, Daily Science News Roundup. Um, this has been Community Coffee by CosmoQuest. Uh, and make sure to follow the links coming up in the chat to know how you can get involved and some of the other stuff we're working on. So thank you and see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.